Hello everyone and thank you much for watching, this is me Mr. P and in this video I'll show you how you can host your own LAN cache server inside the Proxmox. Let's begin. To have your own LAN cache server is amazing when you're hosting a LAN party, when a lot of people trying to download the same game, so you just pre-cache the game inside your local home network, inside your local server and all the people, all the nodes will download the game from that server instead of using all your ISP speed, all your download. As a single user, LAN cache is not the best option to go for, it's not that useful. For me, it's useful for basically one reason, my ASP speeds for download is not the greatest. For the context, if I want to download a Borderlands free game, which is up to about 100 gigabytes in size, that game for me to download that game will take about four and a half hours. So my idea for me to use a LAN cache is if I'm going to download this game once, this game will be pre-cached inside my LAN cache server. And when I want to download this game on my Steam Deck, the Steam Deck will download this game from my LAN cache server using my local home network speeds instead of waiting for four and a half hours to download from a Steam server. So when I start setting up a LAN cache inside my main Proxmox server, I, I actually already have a LAN cache running here under 101 ID number and I already have about 600 plus gigabytes of data pre cache I've been using this for quite a while now. As you can see, it's been up for three days and 22 almost, almost four days. So I'm just going to guide you. I'm going to give you a demo how I got this all set up. So number one thing, I need to jump inside a TrueNAS and create myself a data set and then share the data set using Samba. So let's do that by going inside the data sets. I will go all the way to your disks. That's where I'm going to store. As you can see that it says here, line cache, 593 gigabytes in storage. Actually, it's over 600 gigabytes. I'm not sure why it's showing lower than 600 gigabytes. Anyway, I will select on disks and I will click add data set. I will name this data set LCYT for LAN cache YouTube. I'm just going to change generic from generic to SMB because I want this data set to be shared using Samba. Once ACL message pops up, I'm going to click go to ACL manager. And instead of root, I'm going to change to the user that I'm using for all my Samba connections inside my main Proxmox. This is going to be Galaxy. In my previous videos, I was demonstrating with the user Dex. Pretty much it's the same, same permission. It's just a different username because I'm using right now my main Proxmox and Truna setup instead of the one that I was using in a previous Proxmox series. So once that is done, I'm just going to click Save Access Control List and wait for this to finish. So once the data set is created, as you can see, it says LCYT and there is no SMB icon here as one above. So I'm going to click on the shares here on the left hand side. Click add, then expand, expand the disk tree all the way to the, the file, the folder data set I want to share, which is going to be LCYT. Name automatically gets populated. I can change that if I want to. I'm going to click save and say restart the SMB. So right now, if I'm going to go inside this list of the stuff, I can see LCYT is being active and is being shared using Samba. So right now, let's create ourselves a LXC container. I tested with virtual machines, LXC containers, LXC containers and privilege, LXC container privilege one. And I think I found the best one that suits for me, my needs. My setup is, I'm, I'm going to be honest, is not the perfect and is not the most secure. I will give pretty much all the access that Docker container, a LAN cache Docker container needs to get everything working. And like I said, it's not the most secure. But anyway, this is my home lab. No one else will have access to this line cache the line cache is not visible from outside network and if any of my friends wants to use my line cache they actually need to be physically in my house connected to my home local network so i think this is probably pretty quite secure for my needs i will give you a demo to start from scratch obviously i can use one of my ubuntu templates but i'm just gonna give you ones from scratch to set up so i'm gonna go inside my drives iso and as and you need to select the storage that you're using for your container templates and the ISOs. Under CT templates, if you click on a templates and search for Ubuntu, you just pick one, uh, want which one you, you want. I pick 22.04, 22.10 somehow just doesn't work on my Proxmox. So I picked the one which it says 22.04. I already got that downloaded, so I'm just going to click con create container. Top, uh, at the top you see create CT. So right now I'm going to give a ID number, which is going to be, let's say, 190. Hostname, I'm going to call this LAN cache YT. It says I'm privileged. I'm going to click and tick this. I want to make sure that this container is privileged. That means it has direct access to a host. And this is one step, one of the, one of the unsecure ways to do. But like I said, this works perfect for me. Next, I, I entered the password. I'm going to turn in the templates. I will start punching Ubuntu and it's going to auto complete into Ubuntu 22.04. Under disks, I will make sure that I select the, my, my most fastest one. And 8 gigabytes is fine because Samba that we're going to mount, that's where the line cache data will store. I'm going to CPU, one is fine, and memory two is fine. 
and the networks network for container will mark DHCP for my lo local DHCP server to assign IP address and the DNS everything is like this and the confirm I'm gonna click finish so we have a container created just before start a container we need to do a couple of cha changes to the container I will select the container here on the left hand side under options under features if you select the features I click edit I'm going to turn a nesting on that allows to run docker containers inside LXC container and I'm going to check SMB and SIF that allows container to receive a mount from SMB so I'm going to just click OK if I chose my container to be unprivileged the mount SMB will not be you won't be able to access this or select that that's why we chose to have a LXC container as a, as a privileged one so I have all this selected and we're going to just click on the console I'm going to say start so we're starting the container for the first time so i have a container running so i'm just going to log in with the username root and a password is the one you chose during the container creation process so enter the password so a couple of things we need to do before going any further is to update the system just typing apt update at double ampersand apt upgrade dash y and press enter so i have my system updated and upgraded so i'm just going to press ctrl l to clear the screen next thing is we need to install a couple of things because it's a fresh container there is no docker there is no docker compose and there is no sif uh, utils installed so we need to write apt install and we're going to start with docker then we need docker dash compose we need git just in case because the line cache docker compose file will be pulled using git so we're just going to put git in here and we're going to put sif utils sif utils is a is, uh, program that will allow us to properly mount Samba Shea inside a container so if you think at the end you're just gonna put dash y it means auto accept everything and press enter and right now I'll wait for this to finish I have everything installed so just to double check the docker installed it's gonna put docker space dash v I get the version of the docker and if I put docker compose space dash v I will get the version of the docker compose and if I put git I can see the git showing up so that is working as if is obviously installed in a the background there is one piece of the program we need to remove from this container for the docker compose docker container properly to work and that is called apt app armor to remove it you just write apt actually let's clear the skin screen apt remove app armor app armor is like more like a let's say a um a security guard that makes sure that container is working properly but because we made our lxc container to be privileged App Armor will complain that we're running Docker container inside it. So we need to remove that. So that's been removed. So next thing is we need to start setting up a mount mount for Samba. I will keep my Samba mount location inside a folder MNT. So I'm going to CD into MNT. And inside here, I will create a folder called cache. So you can name this folder whatever you want. I'm just going to name this folder cache. And that's where I'm going to mount the Samba share. Next thing what we need to do is create a credential file that we will use to access the Samba. I'm going to leave that credential file inside the root folder. Inside the root folder, I'm going to create a nano. Let's say put dot, dot in front and put NAS. If I put dot in front, that means the file will be hidden. So if I'm going to say, for example, let's quickly close this file. So if I'm going to put ls, as, as you can see, there is, it's telling me that the folder is empty. If I put ls dash space dash l, it says files zero, nothing inside. But if I'm going to put ls space dash la, I can see my file showing up because it has a dot in front, so we're showing hidden files. So I'm going to just put again nano dot nas. And the way I need to provide my credentials to Samba for fstab function is just simple. Just put username equals galaxy and a password equals galaxy. This is a username and a password of my true nas, which user you're using inside the true nas. So if I'm going to go under the credentials, I'm going to say local users inside the TrueNAS. If I search for Galaxy, this is the user I'm using inside TrueNAS as my main Samba mounting user. So if I want to mount Samba from TrueNAS on my phone, I'm using username Galaxy and a password Galaxy. If I want to mount the Samba to my Windows machine, it's again Galaxy and Galaxy. It's just the user that you're using to mount the Samba shades. Yours probably going to be different. And if you followed my previous episodes, you will notice that I've been using Dex and Dex as my as my username and a password. But this is my main TrueNAS. And my main TrueNAS has Galaxy and Galaxy username as a password and a password. So once I entered all this, I'm going to press Ctrl X to close, Y to save, Enter to confirm. So next thing, I'm just going to quickly go back inside the mount. And this is where my cache is. So next thing is we need to update fs tab file to auto mount our samba 
To do that, I'm going to type nano space slash etc slash fs tab and press enter. And next, uh, on the second line, I'm just going to start typing. So first, I need to provide a P address of a Samba server. In my case, it's going to be my TrueNAS server and it's ending with 124. Next is the folder name. In my case, it's LCYT, which is inside the shares. I'm going to click on here, click view of my shares. As SCYT, this is the one we're using. So let's go back inside here. Next is space, and then you need to provide where you want to mount this file on this share. In my case, it's going to be MNT slash cache, like this. Then what kind of file system we're using? I'm going to use, put SIFS. This is what we're going to use to mount Samba. And next, we need to put user, comma. That's instructing to FS tab that we're going to use user credentials to log in. It's not the Samba needs to have username and a password to log in. So now I'm going to put credentials equals and now I need to point to the file that stores credentials for the Samba. In my case, it's a root slash dot nas comma. Next thing is we need to provide what kind of hashing um, hashing style of the data is. IO chart set equals UTF-8. This is what we're going to use. Comma. No perm. That means that don't amend any permissions between the Samba and the local network. This means whatever permissions inside the Samba, it needs to stay like that. And then zero zero stands for auto try try auto mount every thirty days and auto and another one or zero means always auto try to mount. So everything looks fine if I entered everything correctly. Credentials root nas. Okay, so that is here. So I'm gonna put Control X to close, Y to save, Enter to confirm. So we updated FS tab file. Now let's try to mount it. So I'm gonna put mount under root mount space dash A. I should mount the file. Um, it says it's a wrong argument. Or something. Let's quickly check what I did wrong. IP address, if to, 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 to. oh, there is no T. It should say IO char set, not IO chart set. Control X to close, Y to save, Enter to confirm. And now if I put mount space dash A, no errors. That means it's great. So if I'm going to right now CD into cache, folder is obviously empty, but right now I'm connected to the Samba share. To verify that it's definitely Samba share, if you put DF space dash H and press enter, as you can see here, it tells me that there is a file location inside the mount cache, which points to this location, to a Samba server. And currently there is 8.3 terabytes of free space. Next thing, let's start setting up the LAN cache server. This is a page, uh, I'll leave a link to this page in the description below, but this is what we're going to use. We're going to use a Docker, quick start Docker setup, and we're going to just copy this. This is why we need to Git, because we're going to Git clone this repository into a folder called LAN cache. So just copy the first line. I'll go back inside my LangCache Cache, Cache LXC container, navigate to the folder under root. So I'm inside the folder root. So I'm going to right click and choose paste as plain text and press enter. And now Git will go and copy all the repository or from this URL into a folder called LangCache. So right now inside the root folder, if I put ls, I can see there is a folder called LangCache. So I'm navigate inside the this. This is LangCache. And if I will do ls-l, so it's more in a, like a table list. I can see there is a four files in here. So what we need to do, have a quick look inside the docker compose YML. So we're going to do nano docker dash compose dot YML. And basically this is uh, instructions to run, uh, to create two containers. A middle one, as you can see here in the instruction, we can ignore it. So basically what it's going to do is going to use version two to create the container called lang cache DNS. Uh, bind the bind the IP address and monolithic will use this Docker container Docker image and create the container here. As you can see, that it says env underscore file. This is the environment file we need to edit. And as you can see, please note it starts with the dot. This is and because it starts with the dot, this is why this list only shows me four files and not more. To see all of them, I just need to put ls space dash la. It actually shows up more than four. There is a hidden file git, uh, env, sorry. There is a two hidden folders, git and GitHub, github. So we need to amend this file. So first thing before amending this file, take a note of your LXC container IP address. To find out that, I just need to type IP space dash A, press enter. And I can see it's 321, no, 132. <laughs> 130 is 321. 132 is my IP address for this LXC container. This is great. Let's just make sure that this IP address will never change. 
for the future when specifically you want to have a Lion Cache where the IP address never changes. And while you selected this container that you're using for Lion Cache, if you click on a network, if you select the network interface, click Edit. And the DHCP, if you click, click status, static and put the same IP address. In my case, it was 132 slash 24. And below that is basically the same IP address, just not 132, but one. This is your gateway. This is your router. So whatever IP address you're using to access your ISP modem router, this is going to be the IP address. And this is just tells us that it's 100, 132. And this is the how many IP address range. Click OK. So I changed that just to make sure that I'm not bolstered up this. I can ping Cloudflare. And if I get the pings back, that means that my static IP is working. I definitely punched the right information. So right now we can quickly see and start editing the env file. I'm going to put nano space dot env and press enter. And there is a couple of things here that you need to change. Other things we're just going to leave by default. So we're going to jump straight away to this line, which says line cache underscore IP and delete this and I put the IP address of my container. In my case is 132 and then the DNS bind again 192.168.178.132. Upstream DNS is basically which DNS server to use if this IP address fails. That means that if um, you basically let's say going on Reddit, you don't need to point Reddit requests to your LAN cache server because language server is basically for the Steam uh, caching. There is no need for that. So if a request goes to the Reddit to this IP address and it fails, which IP address to use next? By default, it was Google. I like to use Cloudflare. This is your preference. You can use Google or Cloudflare. Google is usually 8888 and Cloudflare is 1111. So that's what I'm going to use. Next is where to store the data. This is quite important. You want to make sure that you direct to a right folder. In my case was mnt slash cache and that's how I'm going to leave it. If you put this the, the destination incorrectly or misspell the location, the your the Linux uh, LXC container will get filled up with the data quite quickly and none of the data will actually go to a Samba. If I go down a bit on this one, let's actually scroll, go like this. So this is how many cache disk size you want to select. It's basically showing here that uh, this is how big the location is. Mine is 8.7 terabytes and this is marked for two terabytes. But I know that I don't have that many games and all the games that I wanted to cache already did. And like I said, it's over 600 megs, 600 gigabytes. So just delete two and put one in front and we'll be fine. Next one is cache index size. So it says uh, 250 index size per one terabyte. 500, I'm probably gonna leave that by default. Obviously I can change this to 200, 250. But to 500 and leave that by default is no problem at all. Next one is cache maximum age. By default, it's set to be a 10 years. I would change that to probably a year because I don't think my server will be alive for 10 years. But this is up to you how long you want to keep this. I'm just going to change this for, for a one year. And last one is a time zone. As I live in the United Kingdom, Europe and London is fine by me. You need to go and find out your uh, location. Like for example, it says America, Los Angeles or Europe Oslo. So you change your time zone here. To save this file is Ctrl X to close, Y to save, Enter to confirm. And I just want to make sure that I have the right folder entered under MNT is cache. And if I do cat.env, this gives me output of the file. And I want to make sure that IP address is entered correctly because this is, I have one go of this. If I start this and if something goes wrong, I need to start everything from scratch, which is actually a good idea for me to do is just do a quick shutdown of this Alexi container. So once container is shut down, I'm just going to go inside the backup, click run the backup and say fresh lang cache start and click backup. So now I'm going to back up this container just in case before running Docker container, if something I entered wrong, I know what's going to happen. I will get errors and stuff. I can go back, restore and run it. So I have a container container backup. So let's go back inside the container and start it fresh. So container started. I'm just going to quickly log in, navigate inside the root and then line cache folder. And now I can go and start the line cache server. To start this inside the line cache folder, I need to type docker dash compose space up space dash D and press enter. And now docker compose will go and check if you have two containers, 
to make this happen. Like I said, one is Langcache DNS and one is called Langcache Monolithic. If they don't exist in your system, Docker Compose will go and fetch them from Docker Hub. All this process should take between 50 to 70 seconds. So just leave this running and I'll be back when this is done. Once both containers are running, you should get the information saying that they're creating a Langcache Monolithic done and Langcache DNS done. So right now I'm going to put Docker, actually let's clear the screen, Docker space PS. I should see the two containers running with the two container ID numbers and they've been up for 24 seconds. So right now Docker container is running. Next thing we need to point Steam Deck. In my case it's a Steam Deck, but you can point, let's say, your Windows gaming, gaming computer where you play Steam games their DNS setting to your Lancash server. How to point the Windows DNS to Lancash server, you'll find a lot of tutorials online. I'm just gonna give you a demo how what I did with my Steam Deck. So first thing, let's open the, the, the console for the Steam Deck. And first thing to check if, for example, my Steam Deck is already pointed to this location is to ping two different, uh, two different servers, services, sorry. Under the Lancash setup, they give you information what you need to, to go for under Docker Compose. If I scroll down a bit, it says here Steam, Lancash, Lancash Net, and Lancash Steam Content.com. Both of these need to point to a Lancash server. So let's check if actually this is happening with my setup. So I'm going to just put Steam, ping space Steam dot cache, Lancash dot net. And it points to the 7.7 IP address, which is a, one of the Steam IP addresses. And next one is going to be ping Lancash Steam Content.com. And this is points to another IP address that is, belongs to the Steam. As you can see, it goes to uh, whatever IP address valve.net. So right now, the Steam Deck has no idea that this Lancash server exists. To point the Steam Deck to the Lancash server, there is a couple options you, need, you can do. Number one, you can go inside the settings, inside the Steam Deck, while you're inside the desktop environment. Click on the connections. Choose the connection that you're currently using. I am currently only connected to the Deck Station 5 GHz Wi-Fi. Under IP4, IPv4, I can put the IP address of my, of my, the Steam Deck, the Lancash, which in my case is uh, 132. And I actually tried this. It doesn't work for me for some reason. And another thing, what I don't really like to have this one here, what if I'm going to take my Steam Steam Deck outside another network? On Inside another network, my basically Steam Deck will try to look for this particular IP address, a Lancash server, but it doesn't exist. Maybe another, another, another network might be like this or might be another IP address. I need another IP address range, so it's not ideal for me. So I decided not to use this, but if you're planning to use Steam Deck always at home or the load games were always, always while you're at home, this is a way to do. Another thing what you can do with the uh, on a Steam Deck is to amend the file, which is called uh, in, in resolve.conf inside etc folder. You can change this IP address to whatever IP address you want to your Lancash server, sorry, and then lock this, uh, this file to be only read because this file is guess all the written every time you start the Steam Deck. How to make that work? You just go and do a bit online search for network manager and this is where you're going to find the instructions how you can make this file always basically stay the way you want. So these both ways you can go and change the Steam Deck DNS uh, DNS point to a Lancash server. I actually went and did a different way. I used the tail scale because I've been using tail scale for quite a while. I'm quite familiar how it's all working. So I decided to go and use the tail scale route. So next, what we need to do is activate a tail scale or no, not, not activate. First of all, let's go to tail scale. So I'm logged in and as a, my user inside a tail scale and the DNS options, if I scroll down, there's a couple of IP addresses, as you can see here showing up. First two are default IP addresses for a tail scale name server. They're all 100, 100, 100, and 100. As you can see, there is a two saying uh, Steam, Cache, Lancache, Net. These ending with 197 is actually my main Lancache server. So with this demo, I'm just going to change that to 132. And I click save and I'll change to this to 132. The way that I done the tail scale in the setup is that if some if uh, the request goes via my tail scale server, via tail scale network, before it reaches this IP address, which is 88, which is actually my pie hole, before it reaches pie hole, it needs to go to these two. So if the request goes to the asking for domain steam.cache.lancash.net, always point to this IP address. 
And if you're asking for langcache.steamdeck.steamcontent.com, always point to this IP address. So this, call, this is feature is called split DNS. It means that you're routing the request to a different location depending on the domain you're asking for. So this is what I did here. So one, this is active. Let's go back inside the Steam and I'm gonna just put sudo tail scale up and I just wanna put accept routes because I just wanna make sure that this is gonna be working. So right now if I'm gonna put tail scale status, I should see that everything's showing up. So right now tail scale is active inside the Steam Deck. And if I'm gonna put Steam, uh, go back to actually my first ping, as you can see, is 132 right now ending, not 77. This was 77, now it's a 132. And next one was the Lancash Steam, Steam content. This is 132 as well. Before it was Valve something, right now it's 132. So both name URLs pointing to my Lancash server, which is good. So let's go and start the loading game. So I'm gonna just minimize that. We'll start the Steam inside the Steam Deck desktop in interface. Let's open Chrome browser because I wanna show you how the best ways to test it is definitely working. So if I'm gonna click on the library, I scroll down a bit of all my Steam games that I own until I find Railroad Tycoon 3. So I'm just gonna go and uninstall this game. This is the one I'm gonna use for this demo because it's just 1.4 gigabytes in size, so it's not a big deal for me to use. And at the moment, as you can see, current speed and peak speed is at zeros. So let's go back to a uh, library and quickly let's go inside the container under CMT, uh, CD into mount. And if I mount inside the cache folder, I can see there is a two subfolders created, cache and log. That means the line cache Docker container creation successfully worked because they automatically created two folders that they need. So right now inside the mount folder, where is my line cache cache folder located? I can put a command called watch. Watch is basically will execute the same command every two seconds. So that means that I'm gonna watch du space dash s cache. And right now, every two seconds is gonna refresh how much space cache folder takes. So at the moment it's seven kilobytes. If I open Steam, as you can see right now, it's still seven. So let's go and select the Railroad Tycoon game. Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. I'm gonna click install. And this is right now make or break. If everything successfully worked, this number will start going up and it means the cache is working. Boom, it's changed to eight, 64 kilobytes. Here we go. And right now, if I'm gonna go inside the container, I will put H after this. It means you do a bit of more human readable numbers. So 53 megabytes being cached, 52. And if I'm gonna click on the download section, Right now, it's peaked at 6.8 megabytes per second on low speed, or 6.6. .6. The maximum that I will ever receive is 8. This how much, like, well, 8.2, if it's, if it's all the stars aligned and it's like a perfect, no one's using a broadband in the entire neighborhood, this is when I get 8.2. But average out is about between 7.8 and 8 megabytes per second. So as you can see, caching is happening. It already did almost 300 megabytes and I downloaded the game already. It's the load to load this game is usually takes between two minutes and two minutes, 20 seconds or so. To be safe, I would say two and a half minutes. As you can see, it's peaked at eight megabytes per second. And right now, while this game is downloading all my home network devices that need internet lagging. So if someone's watching YouTube, it will buffer longer. If someone YouTube watching Netflix, it will buffer longer or will stutter. If someone making, a, let's say a video call or FaceTime or whatever, the is gonna start getting pixelated because my Steam client or my Steam Deck is using all that download that my ISP provides. So I'm gonna leave this game to download and pre-cache and what we're gonna do next is we're gonna uninstall this game and install again, but this time the game will be downloaded for my LAN cache server. So here we go, I have a game downloaded and this max peaks at 8.1 megabytes per second. So I'm gonna find this game, Railroad Tycoon 3, I'm gonna delete this game uninstall and right now it's cached 865 megabytes the lion cache will not always will not always like back up entire everything so even if a game shows that it's gonna take where is it actually where is that game even if a game is showing that it's gonna be 1.5 gigabytes the lion cache will back up big part of that game but not all of it so as you can see it's 1.48 gigabytes but it's backed up enough files for me to basically get this file download this game downloaded much faster so before it was 8.1 megabytes download speed. So I'm gonna click install. I'm choosing the same location, everything the same, 
but right now when I click next and Steam starts the loading, the Steam client will ping the internet for steam.cache.linecache.net uh, server, but my tail scale will stop that request and say, wait a minute, I already have this direction to tell you that you don't, you don't need to go to a Steam server, so you need to go to Lancash server. So I'm going to click the load. So let's see how on the load, it's already boom at 13, 19 megabytes per second, 24. The game will be downloaded in 13, stretch 13. It will be downloaded in 25 seconds. In 30 seconds, I will get the game downloaded when I wait, waited more than two minutes. So it's peaked at 34, 37, 37 megabytes, almost 40 megabytes a second, 42. So I downloaded this game in less than 30 seconds. And it's peaked at 42 megabytes per second and previously was 8. So it's uh, it's a bit faster. Yes, I need to download every game at least once, but the way I did, I just had my work computer with the Steam installed that my work computer barely actually runs any game. I just had the Steam installed on my work computer and I was just cycling through all my Steam library downloading one game at a time. There is a, obviously a third party program called like a pre-fills, like a Battle.net pre-fill or Steam pre-fill. I tried to set them up, but it just didn't work. And anyway, I'm not planning to download all the games from my Steam library, just the games that my Steam deck, uh, plays so they need to go and just get all of them in but going back to this peaked uh, before it was 8 8.1 megabytes a second right now it's at 42.3 megabytes a second so it's um it's it's way faster so this is how i got the Lancash setup done like i said i've been using a main Lancash server already with the system so if i'm gonna go quickly i'll show you the the size that at the moment i done so if i'm gonna put cat i created the quick script that is gonna output the files how much i cached so the most recent one is 616 gigabytes of games cached to my line to this line cache server and uh, like i mentioned in the beginning of the video is probably not most secure way to do it's not most elegant way to set up a line cache server but it works for me it's for my home lab and no one else has access to it. If someone from my friends wants to have access to the Lancash server, A, they need to persuade me to give them access to my Tailscale network, or B, they need to be inside my house connected to my whole home network, and then they need to know the IP address for my Lancash server to actually utilize that. Anyway, this is how you use a Lancash server inside of Proxmox, or how you set up a Lancash server inside of Proxmox. Thank you much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. All the, all the links that you need and all the commands that you need to run inside to get this set up, you will find in the description below the like button. Just go and follow them. It's easy peasy, easy peasy to set up. Anyway, I'll see you in another video. Goodbye.